Hello and welcome to Global Ideas. I'm Anilish Kumar. This is an initiative by Hong Kong Baptist University to bring some of the finest minds together to help us understand some of the complex challenges of our times. Now, so far, the focus of this series has been to explore what is called the new Cold War from various angles. And in that, we have discussed India-China relations. We have discussed US-China relations. However, it's important to point out that we have not confined our discussions only to foreign policy because new Cold War is not just about foreign policy, it's a multi-layered issue. So please uh, visit our social media pages to find out what we have done so far in detail. Now, an important question at this stage is what could be the potential role of emerging economies in this wider contest between two superpowers, that is US and China? And one such country that might have a significant role to play is Mexico, not only because of its geographic location, but also because of the interesting trends that we have seen with its rising trade partnership with China, but historically being close to the United States. So to bring Mexican perspective to this discussion, we are delighted to be joined by a veteran diplomat still serving his country on a foreign soil. We have with us Ambassador Federico Salas Lotfe. Ambassador Lotfe has dedicated his career in studying international affairs, especially Mexican foreign policy, in addition to his diplomatic duties, he has pursued academic endeavors such as teaching at various universities in Mexico and writing for several journals. His career spans both the multilateral sphere in the United Nations in New York and in UNESCO in Paris, where he was the permanent representative of Mexico. He also served in the embassy of Mexico in the United States as head of the political and congressional affairs division and has headed the Mexican embassies in Czech Republic, Israel, Indonesia, and now India. Mr. Ambassador was also the director of policy planning and chief of staff of the Mexican foreign minister during the late 90s, where he shaped the course of Mexican foreign policy towards the end of the millennium. Ambassador, it's a privilege to have you. Welcome to Global Ideas. Thank you very much. It's my privilege. And to bring the perspective of communication, we have Professor Daya Tusu with us. Professor Tusu is a renowned global scholar of international communication. He is widely known for his extensive publications in the field of media and communication. He is the founder and managing editor of the SAY journal Global Media and Communication. He has authored or edited 20 books, and some are saying the 21st is coming out soon, so we're excited about it. He has been a distinguished visiting professor and inaugural Disney chair in global media at Shingua University, Beijing and currently is teaching at Hong Kong Baptist University. It's a pleasure to have you, Professor Tusu, again, Global Ideas. Thank you. We also have a colleague with us, Mr. Vincent Wong. Mr. Wong is currently a PhD candidate at Hong Kong Baptist University with 25 years of experience, industry experience in the field of media. He's a pioneer in promoting solution journalism in Asia. He has an MBA and LLB from University of Cambridge and University of London, respectively. Vincent, it's a pleasure to have you again. Thank you. All right, so we'll start, of course, with our guest, Ambassador uh, Federico Salas in, in, in India, representing Mexico. Now, Ambassador, the last time we had a conversation, that's you and I had a conversation in professional capacity, I was a journalist back then. And one of the things that we said in journalistic circles is that if there is one community of people that is extremely reticent that you can never have a proper direct answer from them are the diplomats. So <laughs> I don't know what is going to happen in this episode, but we are hoping that you will help us understand rather than defend your position throughout the episode. <laughs> so let the discussion begin. And the first question, Mr. Ambassador, is how would you describe the new Cold War? What do you, how do you make sense of it? Well, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, as I it is really a privilege for me to be participating in this uh, in this panel uh, or, or this uh, event. Uh, I will try to uh, you know put aside some of my my diplomatic uh, uh, proclivities and and sort of emphasize you know probably you know the uh, probably more the the academic and the the political analyst type of uh, of, uh, of framework here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure, and I've been giving a lot of thought about this, I'm not exactly sure that we're actually 
in a new Cold War or entering a new Cold War in the sense of what we lived through in the decades after the Second World War and up to the, um, uh, to, to the end of the 80s, basically. Um, the situation is very different. And, and let, let me speak from the perspective of, uh, of, of Mexico. Uh, we don't see, of course, a, a military confrontation in the making between the two, uh, between any, any of the large powers that are uh, uh, you know, in, in the world today. And that's not only the United States and China, but you also have to include the, uh, uh, the Russians uh, in, this, in this equation um, as being sort of on opposite sides of the ideological divide. Uh, but nonetheless, that is not you know, something that, that, is, um, that we are concerned about. Uh, secondly, we're also not in a situation where uh, we are being asked to take sides uh, in a divided world. Uh, as you very well recall, the, the, you know, the, the Cold War, it was either you were with the uh, American-led uh, liberal order as it was understood at the time, or you were in the Soviet camp. There were, of course, attempts to create middle of the ground uh, uh, scenarios like the non-aligned movement and other such such ones, but uh, but nonetheless, that is not a situation where we are right now. The the the, uh, the competition that does exist between the United States and China primarily is not one of an ideological nature. Uh, no one is being asked to take sides in a in a uh, ideological position, uh, nor are they. Um, uh, the you know the we don't really feel, for example, that the the the, uh, the Chinese are out to uh, destroy the liberal order as it exists, um, and you know the the on, the on the American side, as much as they may criticize and have reservations as to what uh, the Chinese are doing, <coughs> very little is being said as to the question of how. Or, or the nature of the government in China, or the, or, you know, the, or the communist government in, in China. So it's uh, in that sense that, that there are major differences. There is a, a very close cooperation amongst what we see as the rivals. Uh, the, you know, the, the United States, I mean, China is one of the major trading partners of the United States. That is obviously something that was not happening during the old Cold War, <coughs> excuse me. So as I said, I'm not exactly sure that we are entering uh, a new or what could be described as a new Cold War. There is, of course, a situation of, uh, of competition more than confrontation, uh, which has its own you know, characteristics. It has its, its risks. It has its uh, areas of, uh, of security and military danger, certainly. Uh, but, it's, but it's a far cry from what we lived through uh, the, the decades after the end of World War II. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you for that comprehensive opening. And th there is a lot to take in. I mean, you say that we are definitely not in the era of new Cold War, but some might, some might say this is new and therefore there are certain things which might not be repeating itself, but playing out in a probably different way because of the time and you know, the age we are living in. But I would like to bring Professor Tusu here. Professor Tusu, it is interesting that uh, Mr. Master mentioned <coughs> Russia, and we have often said that in this binary of US and China, we tend to forget other important countries. Uh, why do you say that? Well, it's like, you know, in the, in the first Cold War also, it wasn't as neat a distinction as it's sometimes projected, you know, or even recalled now in historical um, details of Cold War. Uh, the ambassador mentioned non-aligned movement, but within the West itself, if you look at the uh, the European position as against American positions on many international issues during the Cold War, first Cold War that is, uh, you can make an interesting case that it was much more um, differentiated than, than bipolar. And in the new version, whether it is happening or not, we don't know, but of course there is a tendency to, um, you know, form groups, but these are not as uh, ideologically driven as was the case in the first um, uh, Cold War. 
Um, so if you uh, think of, for example, I mean, Russia was mentioned. Um, Russia is a very, very powerful country. And Russia is sitting on 10,000 nuclear weapons. It has, you know, largest amount of uh, water in the world, drinking water in the world. Um, it is a very powerful scientific uh, and, you know, uh, intellectual uh, resource rich country. Um, so, and it has a certain ambiguous relationship between the, with the West as well as with China and with India, for example. I mean, India is still one of the largest uh, uh, buyer of, of Russian um, defense equipment. So uh, it, it's, it's complicated and it's always been complicated. I think what is interesting in the, in the new version is that um, the regional uh, groupings are becoming more important. Uh, of course, the European Union, major player, but even uh, within, you know, non kind of Western world, you can think of the BRICS uh, group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. You can think of SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is also expanding now. They want to bring in Iran into it. So there are interesting uh, uh, kind of polycentric tendencies emerging in a world uh, that we are living through at the moment. And I, I do think that uh, in, in this new reality, the, the, the role of um, developing countries, uh, emerging economies, if you like, and of course, emerged economies like China is going to be more pronounced than was the case in the first Cold War. Right, and you, you also mentioned, you know, uh, and rightly so, about the power that Russia has. And that reminds me of the power of resources and the, and, and the power of technology in this new age. Um, and Vincent, uh, you know, we were talking about how technology might play an important role in this new Cold War, right? I think um, there is this new Cold War discussion, which a lot of us uh, still think that is definitely different from what we call the Cold War 1.0, and it is not happening right now, or maybe in a very different form. But we definitely saw during the Trump administration, there's a trade war between the US and the China. And between the trade war and the new Cold War, there's definitely a technology war. The global narrative, there's a technology war going on. Uh, competition of standards, competition of uh, adopting what kind of platform. So there's been a huge debate over China's uh, fifth generation technology, 5G. And arguments have been made for and against it as well. So Mr. Ambassador, from, from that perspective, can you, um, shares some thoughts about the technology adoption policy or the direction that Mexico is going to adopt, or at least what would be the basis of such decision for countries like Mexico facing a competition of technological standards, different platforms are um, engaging as well as competing for your attention, for your country's attention. <laughs> Well, you know, the, I mean, of course, there is this trade competition going on. And uh, I mean, we should not be surprised that a lot of it is focused on technology because that is, that is the new thing. That is what is there right now. Uh, uh, as well as, you know, some, some other, some other traditional uh, uh, goods and, uh, you know, uh, uh, that uh, commodities that are also still very important, but they are also, you know, have gained in importance because they are important for the technology that we're using uh, uh, nowadays. So this is something that, of course, uh, uh, the you know the, the richer countries or the most te technologically advanced countries are competing for. Uh, and in the case of, of of Mexico, well, you know, we are obviously, uh, you know, as you as you well know, you know. Our market uh, and our trade relationship is very much linked with the United States. We are trade partners with the United States, together with Canada, in the what used to be called the North American Free Trade Agreement. It was revised and changed. Uh, there was some renegotiation that took place in the past couple of years, and last year was uh, adopted. And it was basically just an, an updating and, uh, and bringing bringing you know to uh, uh, to the fore. The fact that um, 
that many things had changed since, since the early 90s when the original NAFTA was, uh, was adopted. So, uh, and this of course brings the whole question of technology. I mean, we are in, in the case of Mexico, we will be uh, you know, very likely to, to have a preference for that technology that works best for, for the, 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 uh, the, the trade relationship that is stronger uh, for us, which is the one with the United States. But having said that, that does not exclude, of course, looking at other options. And we have been looking at other options. Um, and uh, so obviously we don't necessarily discard the possibility of, uh, of adopting Chinese technology if it's, you know, if it's something that is going to be appropriate. The way we see it in Mexico also is that, you know, notwithstanding the competition and the restrictions that may say the Americans have imposed or, or, or can impose on some sort of uh, Chinese technology is that there is going to be kind of an assimilation uh, or, uh, or uh, of, of, of the technologies available that will be useful in the United States as well as in Mexico, even though they may be coming from China. Um, I said earlier that you know China is a major trading partner with the United States. Mexico is the main trading partner of the United States today. And uh, as a matter of fact, we are a competitor with China. Uh, we, uh, we're very happy that we're winning in this competition in terms of the uh, share of market uh, access with the, with, the, with the Americans. But again, that also has a lot to do with, uh, with, the, with the existence of a free trade agreement and a long-standing history of... of so, uh, sorry, to, sorry to interject, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, one, one quick interjection here. Uh, the reason that this discussion about technology comes again and again, and the reason about which way Mexico is going to kind of lean towards, whether traditionally to the United States or China, is because of this surge that we have seen in terms of vaccine cooperation between China and Mexico, right? China was one of the first countries to provide Mexico with huge amounts of vaccine in the times of crisis. At the same time, the investment in sectors like oil and energy and power is very, very significant. Something that United States probably has not been paying attention towards. But we are talking about the emerging relationship between Mexico and China. So on one hand, when you say that you are in fact competing with China, but on the other hand, when we see the reports in Mexican media and, and some of the statements by politicians, we get a sense that you are getting more closer to China. There's nothing wrong in that. And, and I would say the ambassador is back when you said, you know, very, in, in a very diplomatic sense that we will, we will go with any technology that works in the best interest of Mexico, totally understandable. But how would you analyze the trends that we see more and more cooperation with China? Nothing inherently wrong in that, but is it happening or not? Well, what is happening is that you know we we have a we have a, 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 a commercial relationship with China and a cooperation with China that is uh, I mean that is there. It's, it's still very small, frankly speaking. And if you compare it with with the situation with other Latin American countries, say Brazil, it's uh, is it's very limited. It is growing. Yeah, that that is that is true. That is a fact. Uh, but uh, but it's still far from being something that of of enormous significance. <clears throat> in the um, in the, uh, in, the, in the in the Mexican economy, I mean, it is important. It is significant. I don't want to minimize it, and it is growing. But I wouldn't say that today that uh, uh, you know that the Mexico-China commercial relationship is you know uh, you know uh, has taken off to uh, uh, very you know uh, to great heights. That is that that is not uh, that would not be an accurate uh, description of it. And uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, I mean, you mentioned, for example, the, the Chinese involvement in questions like, uh, like security and oil and uh, other, other sectors of Mexico. Uh, there again, you know, the, the, uh, most of the, uh, the relationship in these sectors that we have uh, with anywhere in the world is with the United States, not so much with China. Uh, and, uh, and again, it's, you know, it's, this is not something new. It's something that, that, that has existed for a, for a large number of decades. <laughs> and, uh, and it will probably remain so because of the, uh, the, 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 the nature of the relationship that Mexico has with the United States, which is intertwined in so many ways. You know, we share a very, a very long border. 
the interaction in the border is tremendously intense. We have many problems together, but we also have tremendous opportunities together. So I, I really don't see uh, China overtaking uh, the, that uh, presence of the United States in Mexico anytime in the near future. Right. Professor Tusu, going back to the issue of technology, how would you say that? I mean, how, how, how do you see this role of technology, especially for emerging economies? Do they face a challenge, like Ambassador said in his initial remarks, that so far we haven't seen these two giants, neither US or China, out in public saying, you have to be with us? Well, it's interesting that Vincent mentioned 5G. 5G is not just about telephones, it's about Internet of Things. It's a very, very significant shift in uh, what technology can do. And it's not, um, I mean, it's not to be taken lightly because there was actually in the last administration of the US, it was very clearly stated, like Mr. Bush said during the Iraq war, you're either with, with us or you are against us. And there were uh, all kinds of pressures uh, exerted on governments not to work with Chinese, certain Chinese companies, especially in the 5G uh, realm. So I think it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, um, and I think in developing countries, they have limited uh, space to negotiate, to manipulate that because they don't have that sort of infrastructure or, or power. Um, and I think th that's where the contestation is going to be more pronounced, although it doesn't get the media coverage, but that's where the contestation is. Uh, for example, in, in many countries in Africa, where, um, you know, this uh, relatively cheap, access to internet, uh, to satellites, to, uh, you know, um, spectrum, etc., cetera, uh, or broadband is something which is integral part of China's going out strategy. Uh, so I, I would be just, you know, cautious about this in the sense that it's actually, uh, we don't know how it will map out because it's early days. But unlike the Western world, China has already launched, uh, you know, this year, was it earlier this year, 6G satellites. So they, they're thinking of the sixth generation. The world, most of the world is left 4G. So there is that kind of, um, you know, technological gap that exists. And China has done that in a relatively short period of time. That itself is quite interesting. Uh, but I had a very um, uh, quick question for the ambassador. I mean, you, you talked, if I may. Um, sure. Uh, you, you talked about Mexico, but I just wonder whether this is something you could replicate across the continent, Southern, uh, Southern, uh, you know, South African continent, South American continent, sorry, because they have similar kind of equations with, uh, with the United States, uh, the, going back to the Monroe Doctrine and you know, this whole history behind that. So do you, do you think it's a, it's a Mexico specific uh, issue or is it a continental issue? I would, I would say to some extent it's a Mexico specific issue. You know, I mean, some countries in Latin America uh, are no longer, you know, their main trading partner is no longer the United States, it is China. Uh, the investment uh, the, 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 that the Chinese have made in countries like Brazil, like Peru, like Ecuador, in Argentina is enormous. I think that in the case of, um, <clears throat> of Brazil, it's something about 5% five, 5 of their GDP is now uh, you know, accountable to, uh, to Chinese investment, which is huge. And, 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 and this is very important because Brazil, after all, is the largest economy in, uh, in, in Latin America. Uh, so yes, so this is, you know, it is a different, uh, a di a different uh, story. The, China, the Chinese uh, diplomacy and presence in Latin America mirrors very much what also what they have been doing in, uh, in Africa. I do sense that, uh, that nowadays, uh, and especially with, the, uh, with this administration then in the United States, they are taking this uh, phenomenon more seriously in the sense that they feel they have to reverse uh, course uh, or try to, again, bring the Latin American countries into the, uh, into the sphere of at least, uh, or, uh, let's, let's call it the commercial sphere of the of the United States, and they're working very hard in that direction in terms of opening of offer, offering opportunities, facilities uh, to many of the Latin American countries. It's not it's not so much the case with Mexico as a special situation because it's naturally there because of the because of the economic relation that we have. But with the other with the other countries in the in the southern part of the continent, certainly now 
the, the United States has sort of uh, you know, taken account that yes, China has made uh, significant inroads in, uh, in many of these countries. And now the United States is, 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 is gonna try to uh, uh, at least reduce the, uh, um, the, the balance uh, with, with, with the Chinese. Well, speaking Thank you. Of, yeah, sorry, uh, Vincent, you go ahead. Yeah, speaking of new technology, I would like to follow up with the Mr. Uh, with another question with the ambassador. That um, the narrative in the new social media world, particularly during mm. the pandemic, is drastically changed over the last tw uh, twenty months or so. <clears throat> so. I think there's a constant reminder from the Western countries, particularly from the States, that Chinese technology may be very advanced, but they are not safe. There could be loopholes, they could actually uh, using backdoor technology to, to steal information or privacy from you. On the other hand, you also have a lot of journalists criticizing Facebook and other social media platform from the United States. And European countries also worried about the US technologies in some way. So, uh, being uh, uh, being in in, uh, in in between, uh, you're a close partner with the United States, as you have said. How do you see these narratives developing in, in the future about technology as a risk uh, from China or from the states? I think uh, that's a very good point. I think that we we have at least in Mexico the sense of a, of a general concern about technologies coming from wherever they may be coming. Uh, and the whole issue of, you know, of privacy and invasiveness that, uh, that these technologies may bring uh, to our lives. And, and I don't think that, you know, in Mexico, I'm talking about the public perception, mm -hmm. is, is uh, a, a clear division is made between, you know, this is America and this is Chinese, or this comes from, from, from somewhere else. <clears throat> as, uh, as you know, recently there was, uh, uh, a few months ago, this uh, scandal that came up with Pegasus technology, which is Israeli. Uh, so it's uh, so so the, the the there is not so much an identification of technologies from X country are uh, something that we should be concerned about, but is the the nature of of, of these technologies, regardless of where they come from, uh, that we should be concerned about, and therefore. <clears throat> maybe some uh, uh, limitations, restrictions, or uh, rules of behavior should be, uh, should be uh, uh, adopted. Okay. Right, right. But you know, it's really interesting when you said it's not about, you know, the, 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 it's about basically the nature of technology and not so much where it is coming from. And some would say that the narrative about where it is coming from, and therefore it is a danger because it is coming from a country called X and Y, also plays out so much in the social media arena, right? Because the narrative is set there. An internet of an X country is dangerous. So our question was shifting a little bit towards diplomacy and social media. Now, you have practiced diplomacy in the pre-internet age and now. Yes. <laughs> That doesn't make you old. Thank, but thank you very much. For you. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mr. Ambassador, how important is you know, how do you react when, when people come to you and probably your team members come to you, or do they come to you and say, we will have to give equal importance to the social media arena in order to shape the opinion there? Does it happen? How does it happen? Yeah. Let me, let me, let me, before I answer that, let me just get back to what we were talking about before. The, uh, in Mexico, a lot of the discussion of these issues is very much influenced by, by the debate in the United States. So of course, if in the United States, there is a, a, a large discussion on issues of uh, privacy and issues of uh, you know, what, you know, how much do certain social media you know, get, into, you know, get into our lives, this also finds an echo very, you know, very much in, in Mexico. Uh, it's kind of, the, the, again, it's the nature of the beast, even before in, uh, internet days, that uh, this type of debates and uh, discussions that happen in the United States are, uh, you know, are very close to, to, to how we, we follow things in, uh, in Mexico. So it's, uh, you know, our, our, um, 
our attitude towards certain platforms, uh, which may be you know, fully American, are very much influenced by the debate itself in the United States. Uh, so I, I just wanted to, to, to say that because that, that it's, it's not, you know, there's not so much an independent or, a, or, a, or an objective uh, uh, analysis of, okay, this, this come from the United States, these others come from other countries. And, you know, the, there's not much differentiation in that regard. Uh, but coming to your question, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, things have changed very much for us in the, uh, I think not only in diplomatic life, but in political life in general. We do, we conduct a lot of our, uh, of our, uh, of our public diplomacy on uh, social media nowadays. Uh, you know, we, we used to uh, try to have uh, press releases and this type of, this, this is totally, you know. Uh, ancient history. Ancient <laughs> history, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, whoever, you know, gets out the Twitter faster, the tweet faster than, than somebody else is gonna, you know, hit the, uh, the, the right spot. Uh, so we're, that, that obviously has changed a lot. I don't know if uh, some of us have mastered it enough. Uh, I've, I've always been very concerned as to why some of our social media, some of the things that we uh, publish on social media do not get more attention. But then again, you know, I mean, you know, probably not too many people care that much as to what an embassy in X country does. Uh, unless you make it somewhat glamorous and uh, you add a, a certain twist to it that will make it more, more attractive. But at times, and sometimes we can do that, especially like with some cultural things, for example. Mm. But uh, but other things, you know, the nature of the beast is a bit boring, uh, to be very honest. And you know, whoever follows us are you know they are the usual suspects, and we cannot really have a, a growing um, you know group of people following you as to you know what what, what uh, as to what we're doing. But nonetheless, yes, that that has uh, that has changed a lot. And uh, and even the, you know in terms of the of the dialogue and communication that exists between, for example, the embassy of Mexico here and our foreign ministry or our government in Mexico, uh, sometimes how we find out or, or learn about certain things that are important to the work that we're doing here uh, abroad, uh, we learn it from the social media, from something that that you know that is published by the social media, say, of the foreign ministry in Mexico or by another ministry or, or a specific uh, figure in, you know, in the political life in Mexico. So, uh, so we really have to be very much aware and follow you know, all of these things all the time. I, uh, here you know, at the embassy of Mexico, and I'm sure many other embassies uh, from other countries do that in every country. I have someone that uh, spends a large part of his, of his time following social media to, to, oh. so that we, you know, can know in real time what's happening that is important to us and that we, if we need to react or do something about. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That's exactly what I would like to ask a follow-up question. Um, yes. On the other <laughs> hand, the social media can develop or create some diplomatic problem, if not crisis, occasionally. Oh, yeah. yeah, so there's an inherent tension between the nature of diplomacy and the nature of social media. Uh, I think uh, being a diplomat, as uh, Analash has said in the beginning, it depends on your finesse and um, subtlety and persuasion skills and all that. And the internet is notorious for its aggression and uh, some people may say there's a mob living inside the social <laughs> media. Um, and in recent years, uh, the West, again, led by the U United States, try to frame the Chinese way of diplomacy as warrior wolf, being more uh, proactive, confrontational, more um, aggressive even sometimes. Do you see a warrior? Do you see a wolf or do you see both um, for the Chinese style of diplomacy in the say last three to five years? Um, I, you know, I think that there, um, how can I put it? I don't, I, don't, I don't necessarily see that what they're doing now with social media is different than what they were doing before. 
Oh, interesting. Uh, in terms of, you know, their, you know, how they were expressing some of uh, their positions and, uh, and taking stances. Let me tell you something, you know, my, my, my origins in diplomacy were in multilateral affairs. So I was, you know, was at the United Nations and throughout my life, I have been very much linked with international organizations where I always had, you know, where there were always Chinese diplomats uh, and, uh, and Chinese had to respond to whatever things were being uh, uh, set there. So this is even before, you know, uh, pre-internet days, uh, the, uh, the Chinese were certainly, you know, uh, very well prepared and uh, on the spot to respond firmly to whatever they felt was, uh, was something that was not in their, in their best interest or, or that they uh, uh, thought was <clears throat> against their, uh, their, their policy. So of course now they're doing it and using it very ably in the uh, in the uh, in the social media, but let's not forget also that up you know not even a year ago, mm. we had a, uh, a a very powerful guy in Washington D.C. Uh, giving you know quite a bit of competition in terms of of, of using social media in a very aggressive way. Uh, so it's you know and we we in Mexico we certainly were. We're both, you know, we were, one day we were hated, one day we were loved. It was sort of, you know, we didn't know where, you know, so every, every morning everybody woke up to say, Let, let's see what happens today. And I think this was happening all over the world. Yes. So uh, it was, I, I wouldn't say that this has been, a, a again, a Chinese specific strategy, but, but they do use it, they use it well. And from my experience now here in India, for example, I've also seen the, um, the Indians being tremendously clever in the use of their social media and responding uh, to Chinese, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just talking about social media, responding about, you know, to things that may have been stated or said in social media by the Chinese and the, the immediate response also very firm. And uh, I, I don't necessarily describe it aggressive, but, but certainly very strong on the part of the Indians. And that's, that's the nature of, of, of what we do also. You know, we don't, you know, you don't let things get through. Yeah, right. so now, but, um, you can I just uh, ask, ask a kind of supplementary question? Yeah. And it's something what uh, Vincent alluded to, which is that does it actually then um, affect the kind of sophistication of diplomatic speak? Then diplomacy has to have a certain language, certain decorum. Um, and you you mentioned uh, President Trump, who would just at three o'clock in the morning tweet something, and it would have like three grammatical mistakes in it. But you know, it's <laughs> coming from the from the President of the United States, and he's making some big statement about uh, an issue, a country, a whatever. Uh, so how is it affected in terms of the, the 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 conventions and the protocols of diplomacy uh, that you know you you do you use very restrained language and but you have few characters and you have to do it almost instantly. So how does uh, a, a, an ambassador deal with his, his or her staff? The great, you got to be, you know, following the, the conventions of diplomacy, but you have to make your point and make it immediately. Yes. Uh, you know, this, um, you one, uh, it, it's it's. I spend a lot of time uh, supervising this type of things because I also I'm a stickler for uh, good language and ha and saying things in a uh, in a proper way. And I think that the language of diplomacy, which may to the uh, uh, to the uh, not so trained observer seem as very. Uh, intricate and you know maybe too polite and whatnot, you can twist it around to uh, uh, with certain subtleties to make it strong and to make your point as firm as possible. And yeah, and, there, and there's certain I mean amongst us diplomats, there's certain certain words, certain phrases that we know, uh, you know, the de the degree of which tell us how how strong you want your point uh, to be. So we, we try to do that. And of course, you know, mastering doing this in, in, a, uh, 
in a in a short context like a like a tweet is always very very complicated, but uh, but at the same time it's kind of fun, you know, try, you know, sure. you know, try, <laughs> trying to get to, to to actually say something substantive. Have Have you it, been Have you been in trouble for a tweet in your career so far, or your colleagues have Have they been in? I in I, I know I know of many of my colleagues. I have not, fortunately, uh, uh, but I do know that many of of my colleagues have gotten into into trouble for it. And, uh, you know, you know, and it sometimes is not so much, you know, uh, what you say in a tweet, even, you know, the even though there may be this disclaimers that, you know, my retweets are not uh, do not mean an endorsement. If you are retweeting, uh, you know, what some dubious political figure said uh, in international politics. You know, you 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 do create uh, you, you you do make waves um, by, by doing something like that. So so one needs to be careful. We we do need to to monitor this very closely. Um, uh, I try to stick to you know to conveying a, a positive note and uh, an informative element of of, of what the, the embassy uh, or the Mexican government is trying to. To get across and uh, or get get through to uh, through social media, and uh, and I'm not you know very fond of uh, of entering into disputes and fights in, in in social media. In that sense, I may be still a bit old fashioned. In that sense, I, I shy away from that. I don't think it's the uh, the 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 venue where this where any kind of disputes or disagreements should be uh, should be uh, arranged. It's very easy, as you well know, for uh, something that is printed in just a few words uh, to be misunderstood. Uh, there is no tone, there is no shade to it. And even though you may, you know, uh, manage the language cleverly, uh, you, you will not get, a, get through, you know, the, the, the right message when it's something of a delicate nature or, or there's something that may uh, you know, uh, so, uh, some people may perceive as being aggressive or that you may sound upset or, or whatever, you know, so one has to be careful with that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really difficult to find a place for sophisticated language on social media. I remember one um, Indian diplomat once uh, saying this in one of his interviews that diplomacy is an art where if you have to say someone to go to hell, you write it in such a way, or you say in such a way that the person feels that he's headed to the best possible place in the world. Now that right. kind of language, I <laughs> cannot expect on social media. But, right. <laughs> but, but you know, but you, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned your role uh, at the United Nations and, and Paris and UNESCO associations with that. And that reminds me of a very important question. I'd like to bring Professor Tusu here. Professor Tusu, we have seen these organizations not being particularly very important in times of crisis. And there has been a huge discussion, especially when President Trump announced that he's going to pull out of UNESCO. And then we saw the huge controversy around the role of WHO. Yes. I mean, uh, UNESCO is interesting because uh, it is related to our field. It's into communication, culture, etc. And I'm very happy to know that uh, Mr. Ambassador has had a stint there. Um, and it's also relates to some ways to the kind of Cold War argument because um, some of us will remember uh, in the 70s, there was a big debate within UNESCO about what was called the New World Inf Information and Communication Order. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and that was the first proper international debate about okay. news media in the developing world, a third world as it was called then. And at that time in 1984, I think it was that President Reagan decided to leave UNESCO, so US left UNESCO, it, it used to almost pay a quarter of its budget. And, uh, and that debate just disappeared. Although the issues that it was raising had not gone away, they're still with us in terms of imbalance and you know, limitation the way the, the so-called third world is, is covered in the international media. Um, so UNESCO had that role and more recently um, in 2017, uh, Mr. Trump, again decided to withdraw um, from, from UNESCO. And this time it was a very political issue. It was about uh, supposedly uh, pro-Israeli, uh, sorry, anti-Israeli, I'm sorry, anti-Israeli bias of the organization. Um, and 
in 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 case of the pandemic, the question you asked me specifically in you know the UN was found wanting in, in especially in the first six months. WHO also received a lot of criticism for its uh, maybe inaction is not not right word, but it's less than effective to dealing with the, with with the most serious health emergency in in living memory, and the politicization of that uh, in the sense that. It was discussed in many, you know, World Bank, uh, not, uh, not World Bank also, but also, you know, there are think tanks and university st academic studies, journalism, uh, quality journalism, that is, that uh, it is being manipulated by China. Uh, if you actually look at how WHO is funded, one of the largest funders is the Gates Foundation, and the United States, the major funder, the European Union countries, the major, China is a relatively small player. Now, this data is publicly available, but the, the narrative was framed in, in a particular way. And I think that sort of smacked to me the kind of Cold War mentality of, and, and it reminded me of the, um, of the UNESCO debates in the 70s about how it was seen as a kind of sponsored by the Soviet Union. The third world was not given any agency. The, 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 the suggestion was these guys cannot have a, a, a discourse about the problems they face. So my... Uh, Question for the ambassador would be uh, in terms of your own ex experience, both at the United Nations as well as in, in UNESCO, um, what do you see these organizations doing in, in, in the sense that they are now, for example, UNESCO, uh, there's a lot of debate these days, actually a couple of articles in foreign, affairs, foreign policy journal I saw recently, which are suggesting that this gap that has been created because the United States had less, has left UNESCO. China is trying to fill in uh, by funding it, by putting its own people, et cetera. So what role do you see for multilateral organizations like UNESCO, like WHO, at a time when we are getting again into some kind of international tension where you know this, this, these organizations are perhaps the only forums where these issues can be discussed at an international level? Well, you know, the, um, I think that the, this, well, fortunately, international organizations in general have been very much maligned. Uh, I think in, in some ways they're like, a, like, like an iceberg and what we see, uh, what they do or not do or don't do especially well is what's above the water, but they do enormous and wonderful things uh, uh, under the water, you know, I mean, if you look at, you know, what UNESCO does in terms of education, for example, sure. in its scientific division, uh, in terms of, you know, it's, it's, a, it's water program or the question of uh, ocean uh, uh, preservation, uh, certainly the whole question of heritage, sure. uh, you know, it's, it's, is, is, is fantastic. The same thing with the WHO, I mean, it's, when if you, you know, in many countries in, in Africa and Latin America and the developing world in general, you know, have benefited enormously by the, uh, by the uh, work of uh, organizations like the WHO. Having said that, of course, you know, they are, uh, they have become through time, uh, heavy bureaucracies. They are expensive organizations. Uh, I think, you know, this is a complaint that everybody, you know, has well when, when you're there. The uh, and that sometimes you know the the, the, the machinery has, has weighted them down. Uh, they do not respond effectively. They do not respond on time. They do not respond uh, appropriately to the scale of the problem that we may be facing, which was what the WHO was being criticized about with the question of COVID. Uh, and uh, and you know and it may be and may be true. I mean all of these all, all of these criticisms. May uh, may carry some weight. Uh, the answer, in my opinion, is that you know most of these organizations do need some uh, you know ref reform uh, to their methods of working. They need to be more transparent. They need to be more accountable. And that goes, you know, for the UN at, in New York at the headquarters and all the you know all the family of organizations, and including, of course, UNESCO, UNICEF, WHO, etc. Uh, I, I think, you know, they, I mean, these are old institutions and uh, they have served very well, I think, uh, but, uh, but they, but, you know, they're, 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 uh, 
they're a bit worn out and they, and they do need to have some new energy pumped into them by means of uh, necessary changes. And of course, there's a lot of resistance within these organizations themselves, yeah. uh, as well as you know, some countries that are, that, you know, are, are benefiting by the fact that the, you know, these organizations are maybe not efficient in one area or the other because that does not have, you know, uh, protects them or you know, from being observed as to what they're doing right or wrong. So uh, I do think that, uh, that uh, you know, the multilateral system is very valuable and is very important. And when we talk about a new Cold War, I really think that we should also be talking about a new international framework that we really need to, uh, to work on and to move in that direction. And that of course requires that we take a very close look at the, uh, at the international organizations that we have and see how we can uh, change them to address effectively the needs of today. We, we talked about technology, we talked about social media, but we also, you know, and also you know, the, the, the traditional problems that we've always had, you know, pandemics, uh, you know, uh, hunger, uh, uh, migration, of course, uh, all of these things, which are you know not necessarily new, uh, but that we really need to address in a, in, a, in a more efficient way, you know, climate change, all of these things, that uh, uh, and, we, and we need more effect, a more effective international system to to deal with this with all of these issues. Uh, so I think you know this is something that we that uh, that we as we move forward in in, in time that we really need to address uh, now. Uh, it is true that um, the, you know, and one should not be surprised. I mean, if the United States leaves an organization, somebody's going to fill the void uh, that they're leaving uh, there. And, uh, and I must say that, you know, China has been, has been doing something that uh, serves them well. And, uh, but then again, this is, it's a something that was being done also by the United States and other countries and has been, have been doing in the past. And that is, getting some of their people, some of their citizens in top positions in international organizations. Uh, I think that you know, some Chinese are heading some international organizations nowadays. In the case of UNESCO, the deputy director of, of UNESCO is a, is a Chinese citizen. Supposedly, they, you know, they become international bureaucrats, but we all know that, <laughs> that that is basically, you know, that's just uh, the tag that they have, but that they also serve to a large extent, the interests of the country where they come from, and uh, and as I said, one should not be surprised that that you know. I mean, why are the Chinese doing this? Because they can, and, uh, and the Americans have done it also in the past. That the French have done it. Uh, India has done it very effectively also uh, in terms of you know, getting some of the, some people in you know the top echelons of international bureaucracies. Uh, I wish Mexico were. Would do more of that, you know. It's a, uh, it helps. <laughs> it's a, uh, you know. But but uh, the you mentioned China. It's interesting that until seven, 1970s, China was outside the UN system. Correct. Well, that, well, Taiwan had the veto power within the UN, UN Security Council. Yes. Which, which effectively meant the United States had three vetoes. It had its own. It had the British veto, and it had the Taiwanese veto. Yeah. So I mean, this, the 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 system itself was fundamentally flawed, right? And and it's remarkable that China, I mean, a relatively short period of time, and of course, it's only in the 1990s that China becomes more more of a global player. Uh, that it's already made a difference to the to the discourse within the international system. Correct. Correct. Although it is often framed in terms of liberal order versus authoritarian orders, and again, there is a bit of ideological uh, contestation there. But the, the point I wanted to raise is that the, 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 the systems that were set up at the end of the Second World War in a very different world environment are by definition not suitable to the 21st century because the world has changed. And, um, and I think that's something which needs a, perhaps we should have a, a, a fuller episode on that and invite the investors again to, to discuss this because it's a really important um, topic. We, we are almost no, running out of time. Uh, I'm asking, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, complete your point. No, no, I'm just gonna say, I fully agree with that. I mean, this is, I mean, these institutions 
are not uh, are not uh, uh, you know uh, we're not made for the 21st century basically. So yeah. we really appreciate your candidates in that. I think you're one of the first or rare diplomats who is saying that we need a substantial change. I mean, the whole debate sparked on social media because President Trump, every other day, he would say, oh, the WH is not working or XYZ organization is not working. But I think he, you, you made a very impassioned argument that China is doing that because China can do that. I mean, it's, it's as straightforward as that. Uh, I'll give the last word to Vincent uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, we, are, we begin with this new narratives of the new Cold War. Mr. Ambassador, where do you see this new Cold War or the new narrative headed to us in the next five years? Well, I do think that uh, we're going to see more of the same. I don't necessarily see any, any major changes happening uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. Uh, you know, there, there will probably be you know, more entrenched positions in, in, in some aspects. I mean, we talked about technology, for example. Uh, that would certainly be a, a contentious uh, point uh, as we move towards towards the future. I think one thing that we should also be very observant about, and I'm very glad that I was able to, to talk to you about this today, is what other countries such as Mexico and other developing countries or emerging economies will be doing uh, and the role they will be playing in the, in the future. Uh, there was some mention of, of BRICS and other such such organizations uh, or, or, or groupings, uh, but you know, I think that the the multipolarization of the of international relations is not necessarily a good thing. We need to you know sort of find common grounds, you know, bring ourselves together. I think the one thing that this uh, pandemic showed, and uh, and it's not a question of just the WHO, is that uh, you know, the limits of, of solidarity and our willingness to act together to address common issues. Uh, and that is something you know, we, we have in just less than a month's time, there's gonna be a, a meeting on climate change in, in the UK, the COP26, we'll see how, how that happens. But, uh, but there is a, 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 uh, something that I would be more concerned about rather than not, not so much as, as a Cold War, but is the absence of, of, a, of a sense of, of a common purpose in the international community and the absence of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a common denominator as to how we resolve issues that are of concern to everybody. Mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a very important uh, question, probably a more important one. All right, so thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador. It was a pleasure thank talking you. to you. Thank, thank you, you all. Much. Thank you, this thank is Professor. Thank you very much, Anglesh, great. Thank you Thank so you. much for, for sharing your ideas with us. Very, very nice. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. My pleasure. And, and probably we'll have another conversation about the world order. Then we will we'll, we'll get some more ambassadors together maybe and have a conversation about that. That, that would be great. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Do I have to formally end this and do that bit of mine? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, for uh, your time. Thank you, Professor Tusu. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, and thank you all the people uh, watching on social media pages. Uh, please stay tuned. We'll be back with more episodes. Till then, goodbye and take care.